Uh, really, I want to see this technology, and I think anybody who cares about decarbonization wants to see green hydrogen or something that looks like green hydrogen uh, decarbonize uh, a lot of uh, industrial operations worldwide within 10 years. And I think we can make pretty good progress um, towards that. So what does it take to revolutionize the green hydrogen landscape? Now we're going to find out on this week's Leaders on a Mission. I'm your host, Simon Leach, and I'm really pleased to welcome Chad Mason, the visionary founder and CEO of Advanced Ionics. Chad is really at the cutting edge of the advanced energy industry. You know, we'll really explore the groundbreaking technologies that set Advanced Ionics apart, addressing the most pressing challenges of our time, our energy challenges of our time. We'll also discuss the state of the green hydrogen journey, Chad's biggest learnings as a first-time CEO, and the common pitfalls that entrepreneurs face in the energy tech space. So, Chad, look, we've got lots to get through. We better crack on straight with it, right? So, um, thanks for joining me today. I know you're a very busy man, and uh, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Appreciate you having me, and I think uh, time of recording is a Monday, so it's a great way to start a Monday morning. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, look, maybe like just share a little bit with me about, you know, when I think about maybe your career journey and what inspired you really, I suppose, to join the advanced energy industry, mm -hmm. you know, give us some context that led to that. Yeah, it speaks to where I started um, in life. And I, I grew up on a family farm in central North Dakota. And I, I read quite a bit of science as, as a kid and was always kind of that science nerd and math nerd as I went through school. And so just combine those two things together. And uh, I love to work with things on the farm and build things. And eventually I ended up building electrolyzers uh, once I started learning about that concept um, in about sixth grade. So... Yeah, it, it became pretty obvious to me as I researched it just how much this was connected to sustainability in an agricultural setting, how hydrogen is used in things like the ammonia that we would put down on the farm for fertilizer and is used in making the diesel fuel the tractors would need and can be used for a whole host of other things like the chemicals and plastics, so on and so forth. So that was really the, the start of that spark uh, of passion to work in, in the energy industry and, of course, eventually help to decarbonize it. Yeah, no, awesome. And, and just from a technical viewpoint, well, you know, what kind of work did you do beforehand? Were you a PhD, um, postdoc? Just remind me what, what you studied. And No, I, uh, I, actually, I actually ended up going, uh, I, I did a master's at Arizona State and before that, I did bachelor's at North Dakota State, like um, most uh, farm kids that end up doing an engineering degree do. Um, but I, I never ended up going the PhD route. It never really fell into place. And I always joke with my wife, who has one. I said, I think one in the family is enough. <laughs> is enough, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of random. It's just how it worked out. And I ended up taking full-time jobs um, in, in a variety of places. Got it. Yeah. And what was like the... The most impactful kind of job that you had before you, you know, before you kind of founded the company. Well, each had their their impact. Um, I was at General Motors on the fuel cell durability team before starting Advanced Ionics, and interestingly enough, that that job actually had nothing to do with what I ended up starting Advanced Ionics for, and. You know, the type of technology we use is extremely different from what a PEM fuel cell uses. But just learning to work in a very large organization like that, it was about 200 people um, as far as the fuel cell team when I was there. And the systems and the processes they had in place, the way they worked with tools like designing for Six Sigma, uh, all of that was very inspirational to me and a very good part of my journey towards where I'm at now. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, so give us a little bit of an overview then about um, advanced ionics and I suppose what you do and uh, and uh, love, love to hear more about that. Yeah. So coming full circle, the, the goal was never like when I was a kid, oh, I want to start an electrolysis startup someday. 
Um, I just I just thought the problem would be solved, and I would be end up I would end up doing other things, kind of naturally. But when I was um, looking at it pretty closely, I was quite surprised that there wasn't any electrolysis technology designed to fulfill the needs of the industrial sector. So what I mean by that is if we zoom out today and we look at where hydrogen is used, it's used in just a couple sectors. It's used to make ammonia for fertilizers, explosives, and chemicals. And it's used in refineries for a plethora of different things. Um, so hydro treating, hydro cracking, desulfurization, methanol production, and then a variety of things like benzene, toluene, um, xylene, methanol. Um, and then it can be used in a variety of the same things that would still happen in a refinery, such as making sustainable aviation fuel. Um, and it can be used to make green steel. So there's all these industrial needs for hydrogen that people just don't realize. They kind of take it for granted and it's, it's out there. It exists. So what, what's interesting is that to decarbonize it, you need to not use methane. Right now, methane is cracked uh, with water to make hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So there's carbon dioxide emissions associated with it. So if you make hydrogen with electrolysis in an electrolyzer using clean electricity, of some sort, you have clean hydrogen and the downstream processes have used clean hydrogen. And so what was interesting is that no, no one had really designed an electrolyzer that was ideally suited to feed these industrial processes, meaning running at the same temperature, designed for on-site integration, and highly efficient. So I said, all right, well, that's what we're gonna do. And so I went about really you know, working to design the electrolyzer from the ground up, really, with, with this mission in mind. Of course, I meant it was like eight years ago, as it were, right? Yeah, I, I ducked in and out of looking at it at a few times, and then I really decided in earnest to, to go on this mission in about 2017, 2018 timeframe. Got it, got it, got it. And looking back now, in that, in that time period, yeah, how difficult a journey has that been? Um, you know, just for, from a technical or technology kind of viewpoint, first of all. Um, yeah, quite challenging because I, I worked in Singapore before being at General Motors and I spent about four or five years in the battery field there. So I, I built up some connections in the battery field, international connections. But when coming back to the U.S., I just didn't have much linkage into the ecosystems in the Bay Area or out east. Um, and I wasn't university affiliated. Of course, I was at GM and then decided to start this. So um, I ended up finding an accelerator program in, in Milwaukee, where I'm at now, called Workbench Labs. And it actually doesn't operate anymore. It went, went defunct during COVID. But that, that gave me the ability to work on this, to develop this. And then I found my partner, Bill um through that process and then we were able to work on the technology and in, in the workshop in the middle of covid uh without being disturbed too much <laughs> um but overall the challenge was very difficult and it really only through some kind of serendipity did one of the co-founders of that accelerator program was working with boston-based um, venture capitalists uh, in the clean energy sector. So that's how we ended up getting our first investment. It, it's quite likely we probably wouldn't exist if that, if that didn't happen, just because we don't have access to that kind of uh, ecosystem, especially impact investors here here in Wisconsin. Got it. Yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely. But it sounds like finding your partner as well was probably a very important aspect yeah. around the kind of growth of the you know, the company, what, what made Bill such a great partner for you? And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, how did that work? Yeah, we, we had coffee the first time and we instantly knew we would gel. Um, I had the mindset of, I could work with anybody as far as, you know, what they wanted to work on. And I would, I would kind of be like putty and just go do the other stuff. And so Bill was very much a hands-on kind of implementer type, extremely inventive. And both of us have really really deep materials, materials compatibility knowledge. Um, so I ended up just taking care of a few of the technical functions, but also just the business side and then let Bill 
purely devote himself to the technical side of things. What was nice too is Bill Bill lets me make the final decision on everything. Um, so that's something uh, I'm very appreciative on, um, but um, it's a bit of a burden too, of course. <laughs> so so it, it's important someone is, is there to make the final call on things, but we do try to have consensus and we almost always do on just about everything. Yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. So tell us a little bit therefore about, um, you know, what the technology does that other technologies don't, as it were, or other, other solutions in this space don't. Yeah. The, the vast, vast majority of technologies in this space really take off the shelf um, proton exchange membrane or some kind of alkaline technology and then, you know, try to do some, some adaptations of it and optimizations. But fundamentally, you're stuck with low temperature electrolysis and you're, you're limited from a thermodynamic point of view to about 40 kilowatt hours per kilogram. Practically speaking, you're going to be in the 45 and up, um, usually around 50 kilowatt hours to make a kilogram of hydrogen. And that's just too expensive, right? In terms of the, is that the challenge with yeah, that price? Yeah, yeah, you hit the nail on the head because electrolysis, and this is where anybody who's been in other clean energy sectors, it's where they, they don't quite get it unless they look at it from an OPEX point of view. Um, of that, about 70 plus percent of the cost of the hydrogen is really just how much electricity you use and the price of that electricity. So we, we ride on the coattails of solar and wind and the price drops there, uh, but it's from an OPEX perspective uh, for us. And so it's important to not get too, you know, in the weeds on CapEx. And so going to high automation, scaling up using low cost materials is critically important for a variety of factors, but it's still only 14, 15% of the pie. So we shouldn't obsess too much <laughs> about CapEx. Uh, so, so, so that's kind of the, the simple answer. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I got it. And so just like having a little read through before, your technology is different because you work more with, so it seems it kind of, you take kind of um, hot temperature. Yeah. Or mid to hot temperature, I think it is, isn't it? So you kind of take steam and deal with that and then convert that into hydrogen, right? Yeah. Nothing's for free. So if you count for the energy of using steam, it adds up to the same. Um, the nice thing with industry, though, is industry already works with steam and almost all of the processes that utilize hydrogen are exothermic or if they're not exothermic, they're still dumping hot steam out anyway. Uh, that has to be recovered. So it's it's available to be used. And this type of technology, as far as utilizing steam, has been around a long time. It's called solid oxide. But solid oxide has had a very hard time scaling up because it's dense, delicate ceramics. And so you're really generally limited to a few hundred square centimeters as far as the size of the cell and then the stack you can build from it. And so what ends up happening is you end up having this balance of plant with a lot of small ceramic stacks in them. It requires a lot of insulation, a lot of balance of plant, a lot of issues with places where you can have failures, things like that. And then of course, there's some higher cost components like high nickel alloys, um, rare earth materials here and there. And so when we started this, this company, we said, well, we want to do what solid oxide can do. How can we do that? But at lower temperatures where we can use stainless steel components in the balance of plant, we don't need so much insulation. Uh, we can use nickel based catalysts and we can also scale it up to very large sizes really to be able to scale up to the same size as alkaline systems can do. And so that's why we really stayed like laser focused on being in this temperature range and then having materials that enable that. And so, so that's what we did. Um, and you know, kind of coming full circle, this gives us the ability to both build large cost-effective stacks without geopolitically sensitive materials, but also balance of plants that people who already work in petrochem and work in ammonia already know how to work with these systems. You don't want to design something that introduces customer friction. And so we're designing something that's really like a hot knife through butter. Uh, with with potential customers. And this is why, um, if anyone's followed our press announcements, why we work with those 
very large hydrogen users that are out there. Got it. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Tell me though, like, because I, I've read lots of the furore around hydrogen mm -hmm. and people talking about it as a, you know, transport fuel, mm -hmm. as it were, uh, renewable transport fuel. But you're focused very much on this kind of industrial kind of um, kind of chemicals, materials. You know what you you know uh, you know as a segment because. Hydrogen is essentially used during that particular process, but you're essentially going to build something on site which enables them to use green hydrogen. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, I think uh, Michael Liebrecht has a really nice hydrogen ladder out there, and uh, I don't think I'd really change anything on it because the places you need hydrogen are where they've already, where you already use hydrogen. Some processes can get away from it in the future. Um, you know, so we certainly expect that as heavy crude use goes down, the amount of hydrogen you need to do desulfurization and hydrocracking will eventually decrease. You will see some uptick in things like the use of methanol. You might see some ammonia transport here and there. Um, sustainable aviation fuel is starting to really settle in as what the alternative is going to be um, for replacing traditional kerosene. So, so you really, you really see that this is the sector that in general that needs hydrogen. Whereas when it comes to the transport and use of, of, of hydrogen as a transport fuel, it, you couldn't pick a worse fuel to use from like, like a properties perspective. If you forget about for a second that burning or use, using hydrogen and oxygen is, is clean to make water, it's not easy to transport. It's not easy to store. Um, and so that's really the in, the inherent um, issue with with hydrogen to be used in in those sectors and and why anybody that goes that route struggles quite significantly. Awesome, yeah. But those two sectors you mentioned there, two of them, or in fact three of them, it's worth just exploring a little bit further because mm -hmm. I've seen so much investment into the sustainable aviation fuel space. Yeah. Clearly, a mandated, an industry mandated sector. Um, you know, lots of infrastructure build. Yes. Um, around this space now. So where, where does this kind of fit in then with that sec uh, sector? Yeah, so there's almost too many different routes to, to name and it even overwhelms me when you talk about how to make sustainable aviation fuel. So something that looks and acts like fossil-based fuel. Um, and so you saw the announcement from, uh, what was it, Virgin Atlantic? Uh, was it this year or last year? I think it was. Um, on that first flight across the Atlantic. So we're going to see a lot more of that. It's a really exciting sector. We're, we're speaking to folks that operate airlines, that supply airlines uh, with equipment. So that's going to go places. How you make it, There's you can start with biomass feedstocks. You can do quite a few different things to those biomass feedstocks, everything from breaking them down and fermenting them, or you can do gasification followed by fischer tropsch um, there's also kind of the method that the Europeans seem to be preferring, which is just take CO2 from the air and then recombine it and, and make sustainable fuel from that. So it'll be very interesting to see how it shakes out. What's central to all of them is they all need hydrogen. <laughs> and our system is going to be the one that's best equipped to supply hydrogen for that process. Oh, no, awesome. I, we, I see the similar thing with the green ammonia. Mm -hmm. Um, because, uh, you know, and also green steel as well. Yes. Um, so they're probably two kind of segments that you've, you've, I've seen quite a lot of press over the last kind of year in terms of, you know, the development of those, um, you know, th those industries as well. So, yeah, a lot of conversations ongoing, I think, uh, certainly in the, in the green steel space. Ammonia is is very very exciting, and there's there's a variety of new pathways to become involved in the ammonia market that are starting to be up and coming. Uh, so we'll we'll have additional commentary on that in the coming year as well, as we um, as we start to announce some relationships in that regard. Traditionally, ammonia has been a very conservative sector, at least when it comes to the fertilizer use, for for reasons that are probably a bit apparent, but. Um, there's a lot of players now looking at using it to transport energy from location to location. Now, I don't think you're going to see a full on replacement of all, L let's just use it as, an, as a straw man, like all LNG capacity becomes green ammonia. I don't think you'll see that, but I think you will see a fraction 
uh, of some of what eventually what, or what at one point was a lot of LNG becoming some green ammonia or green methanol or, or toluene transport to kind of fill in gaps that certain countries have with needing some excess energy here and there during certain seasons. Got it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so like from a business model viewpoint, how, how does how does your how does it work like with your, you know, is it a particular license or is it a product that you sell? Um, how, how does that work? Yeah, we've yet to formally announce anything as far as okay. how the relationship will be with the customer. We're still actively looking at that. Of course, <laughs> very simplistically. We're, we're building a stack here. We're going to qualify a stack. Um, balance a plant. We will be working with some partners on various aspects of the balance of plant that just allows us to move faster. Um, but we, we have nothing really concrete to announce on that yet. But uh, there will be some things coming down the, down the pipe here. Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm sure there's many different models that you can kind of look at with this as it were um yeah and if you just take a quick look at the at the petrochemical sector and i think it's kind of a black box for many people but how that sector is supplied where different players add in their own verticals that's something we're looking at quite closely because i think eventually our sector starts to look a lot like just any other sector that supplies equipment to heavy industry yeah um, i think for a long time we were seen as this kind of interesting thing that looks like solar and wind projects or battery projects but hydrogen is not that and you know i think people now um now that the hype is settling down are starting to realize that this looks more like traditional petrochemical uh sector sector wise at least sector wise yeah okay okay do you think that's where we are on the journey over, over the hype a little bit well you know because it has mm -hmm. the last couple of years there's been so much talk and hype and uh yeah, I'm just wondering if it's died down a little bit and it's become a little bit more realistic in terms of what the sector is going to do. Yeah, we're definitely past the hype bubble. I think we'll go through some trough of disillusionment, as they say. So, you know, we're well positioned to, to come through that real strong. We have a very differentiated product, strong team and, and um, excellent technology. But I think you're going to see some some turmoil in the sector just because the the bubble was way way overinflated there for a few years. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So tell me then, when you think about your, I don't know, the hopes and dreams, right? Um, you know, over the next five, ten years, in terms of, you know, what you would want to kind of achieve with the company. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Was that Bill Gates that says um, you kind of underestimate what you can do in one year and you. <laughs> or you overestimate what you can do in one year and underestimate in 10 years. Um, so I, I hate to underestimate what we can do in 10 years. Uh, really, I want to see this technology. And I think anybody who cares about decarbonization wants to see green hydrogen or something that looks like green hydrogen uh, decarbonize uh, a lot of uh, industrial operations worldwide within 10 years. And I think we can make pretty good progress um, towards that. So, um, so yeah, that, that, that's the simple answer of what I'd like to see. What we need to do internally is continue to make and prove out milestones on our path here as far as building the stack, demonstrating the reliability that uh, people want to see, making larger stacks. Um, and we have really fantastic partners who have been helping us along the way, like Repsol, like RPE. We're about to have another announcement here. Um, within, I think within the month on another partnership coming up, all very exciting things. Um, and then beyond that, we just need to start scaling up and, uh, deploying the units in the field, uh, within the next few years and, um, and then working with all the folks who are all over the world who need the, need the technology for both existing uses. And of course, new, new builds of ammonia plants or green steel plants or whatever it may be. Yeah, awesome. So you're looking at things very internationally. Yeah, you you have to. You know, for the longest time, the the European energy majors were our strongest um, partners to pull, and in many ways they still are. Um, we've seen quite a bit of pull from Japan. Of course, we have Mitsubishi Heavy Industries as one of our investors who joined us last year, and. 
you know, what's interesting in the U.S. is even with the IRA, I think it's been a bit of a slower moving market, even with the hubs. Um, the Biden administration last year released some kind of demand side incentives that I think was really smart um, because the IRA on its own was really just a production incentive, which is a little bit disjointed. And that's where kind of the demand side incentives are very helpful. But I think we need more of that. And that'll help to really drive, like I say, the demand for the product, the green hydrogen product itself. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's great. And uh, look, a few things just to unpack that you've mentioned there, because I, I would imagine, I suppose, two or three major uh, components to your to your job. One, like fundraising. How have you found? I think you, your last round, you closed an A round. Am I right in thinking it was October last year? Yeah, correctly, I'm trying to remember when we did the announcement, but it was in August last year. And uh, yeah, we've had pretty good momentum coming off of, you know, tailwinds from that and have been hiring people, continuing technical progress. Um, and uh, yeah, to your point, uh, one of my many, many jobs is uh, fundraising. I have a great team that works with me on that, um, such as my commercial officer. Um, but it is definitely a, a full-time effort for, for many people. Yeah, does it remain a full time effort? Like, 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 when you think about the intensity of going into the raise, you close a raise, like your Series A, and yeah. we've probably got runway for a certain amount of time. But yeah, are you able to kind of step off the pedal when it comes to the intensity required to build those relationships and network for future capital? Yeah, there there was a time in. Um what was it? I want to say it was in 23. Also, there was a time in 22 as well where it was quite full time for a little while. And then other things just don't get as much attention internally as they need to. Now we do have more team members. And so it's in a much better spot, but it can be a big burden for any startup. And I think many founders really underestimate how big of a burden it can be. So, so it's something to account for, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also just like getting to that Series A, that milestone, now you're bringing on strategic investors, I would have thought, with Mitsubishi and the heavy, uh, on the heavy industry side, right? Yeah. So how, how, how different do you have to run the company, you know, when you make a kind of Series A and you've got that kind of interest in investment? It's interesting because I think a lot of people, you know, they have experience in just corporate or in small business or that. And a startup is kind of all of those things, you know, amalgamated together, but it's always changing and morphing. Um, so it requires a certainly a very special mindset to say that there's a right time for everything, you know, because there's, there's an attitude you have to very much fight against, which is, you know, I'm a hammer, everything's a nail, and I'm going to pound everything. Because if you do that, you'll burn out, you'll burn, burn your staff out, and you won't stay focused on what are the critical risks to retire the here and now, and what are the things you need to prepare for, and then what's the infrastructure you have to put in place within the company itself as you go along that journey. Because you can overburden yourself with too much kind of even early corporate infrastructure if you do it too quickly. But if you get behind the curveball as well, you're you get disjointed and disorganized and you might have trouble doing project management or hiring or a variety of other things. So, so especially like after the A round where we've gone from a little under, I think it was under 20 people. Now we're about 30 people and we've really had to build out a lot of project management infrastructure internally, better operations capabilities internally. And it was really a year long thing that we've been doing and it's been extremely successful so far. Uh, but we've had to make the right hires. We have to say, this is what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna do it. And you have to be very deliberate about it. Um, and we also had to improve things like the ability to hire people quickly. That requires infrastructure. You can't just say here, HR person, hire somebody. <laughs> uh, there's a lot that goes on. Uh, underneath that, especially if you want to bring in really great people. So, yeah, yeah. so you're having to find your, yourself working more on those activities, as it were, as a CEO. Yeah, so 
So I, I'm, I'm quite hands-on with hiring. You know, we have two 30 or 45 minute meetings a week. You know, the interview process, we've made it quite streamlined, quite efficient, but it took a lot of hard lessons to get there. Um, and yeah, just everything that goes into it. Uh, same with project management. You know, internally, if you're developing new materials, new technology from scratch, and you do all the engineering all the way through, even though we have consultants, we have firms we work with to help us, we're managing 30, 40 projects at a time. Like that's not, I mean, they're all intertwined with each other. <laughs> so that requires like a really like steady hand with that kind of stuff. Yeah, yes. Yeah, compared to maybe managing a lot smaller numbers pre the A round, right, as well? Yes, yeah, there it's, there it's a little more straightforward but you also don't have the fallback of the infrastructure. You got to have somebody that just does it. So you have to have those kind of people that are like Swiss army knife type, uh, especially in an early stage. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about also, you mentioned there about like partners, you mentioned like Repsol and RWE and other yeah. ones, you know, in terms of building credibility relationship and developing that, that capability as it were, how's that journey been for the company? It's it's hard. You have to decide um, kind of what band-aids to rip off and which ones to leave on, in a sense. And um, we we had to make some pretty tough decisions early on that were probably the right ones. Uh, but you end up having to kind of pay the price on some regard. So a few examples is one we mm. we ended up building our own test stations. What it taught us is how to work with steam, how to do all these things, but it did save us a lot of money and we're at the point where we can design much larger systems ourselves. Um, but we still do get outside help here and there. And so it was a painful process. You know, the second thing is we, we scaled up the architecture pretty rapidly. So most companies, especially if they're university incubated, uh, they'll work on a tech for many years, five plus years, small size, button cell size, little, little size. And then, they have it working great, and then they decide, let's make it bigger, and they find out, oh, the the physics changes, the, the transfer functions change entirely. We've got to throw all of that out and redo everything. And so we very intentionally scaled up quite large in size. Um, I would say we're, we're double or triple the size from a cell area versus a solid oxide, um, state-of-the-art solid oxide. The problem is, is though, is we had to skip a lot of steps along the way. So we're having it, it, it allowed us to move a lot faster. And I think the results will bear that out in the long run. But it does mean that we've had to go back and, and figure out some fundamentals, especially with control strategy, transfer functions, some of the physics. Um, so a little bit of building the airplane while you fly it, you know, not, yeah. to, not to be That's people kind of use that cliche probably too much, but for us, it's definitely true. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, no, that's, that's great because you can't, you know, if you're working with the partners, you, you need to demonstrate and build your own capability uh, and to be able to kind of iterate and, um, and learn quickly, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our partners have been great. Um, some of the partners we have that are investors or they've helped us with demo projects, but we have a variety of other partners that, you know, we just uh, pay to help us with some subsystem on the test station or on some modeling or, or whatever that might be. Yeah, yeah, no, got it, got it. And uh, look, you mentioned there about, say, some of the lessons, the hard lessons on the hiring side. Have you generally found, um, yeah, what have been the hardest lessons do you think you've learned on that? On that? Yeah, it, it's one thing you you never want to do is is have too long of a hiring process. I'm sure you know this this very well, that you can lose candidates. Um, it can also convey disrespect towards them, even though it might and generally never would be intended. Um, and so you want to make sure you have a really efficient process. You're communicating with people constantly being very honest with them about where we're at um, with it. So we got that in a really good place this year, but it took some some painful lessons there. You also want to be very cognizant of the fit. Um, we've had very, very good retention 
Um, you don't want to have too good of retention because you want to make sure that if this isn't the right fit for someone or they're not happy or they're not performing well in the job they've been assigned, that you find a way to help them. You find them a different type of role within the company or you find what their, their happy role would be outside the company. So you got to be very, very much on top of that. You got to be honest, full 360 honesty with each other. Um, not everybody can handle that, but most people can. Yeah, yeah. And um, when you say about the culture and hiring for culture, like, well, what do you, you know, I suppose what you're interviewing, what do you really look for? What makes a good employee in terms of the, the kind of core behaviors or competence? Yeah, that you, that you bring into the company. Yeah, I mean, um, there, there's a few things we really look for. So, you know, being a startup, uh, you, you do want to make sure people are very proactive and they don't just kind of wait around here, give me work. So you need people that are grabbing work and you don't need to stay on top of them. Um, it you know, goes without saying teamwork. We also really emphasize customer um, and that customer can be someone who's both inside the company. It could be your colleague, but it's also somebody that's outside as well. So really building on that customer focused mindset is important Good. It's good for building muscle memory for when we're delivering product outside. Um, and then just things like respect. Uh, we're a Midwest company. And I think that's something Midwesterners are really, really known for is being respectful of one another and really asking for that. Uh, so it's something we, we really believe in. And, and that can mean a lot of things that flow from that. But um, Yeah. So those are just just to name a few. But. Yeah, no, great. No, no, great. I suppose it's always the challenge with a being respectful, which is essential, but in a startup, being able to be really honest, yes. transparent, and share feedback without taking it personally. That's Correct. the thing, isn't it? Yeah, the, and that's something that Bill and I set the standard for really early on is We've never had an issue where we're in a big like disagreement or anything with one another because we just say it. We let the do the facts do the talking, and we quickly figure out what's the logical way uh, to do something. But it can be a little bit intimidating to new people who get hired. Um, so you want to try to make sure you're inviting them in. Um, I know, like in the West Coast, they like to use the term "radical candor." I think it's a little bit of a silly, overused way of phrase, but. That's a Midwesterner and me talking. <laughs> um, but there is a proper way to be candid with, with other people and um, be honest and transparent in an authentic way. Yeah. Yeah. No, great. And um, look, just, just on your journey as a seven and a half years into kind of co-founder, CEO of the company, you know, what have you found, you know, the, the most kind of challenging you know, from, from a personal perspective? I'd probably give different answers at different snapshots in time. Um, right now, I've been really obsessed with how to, you know, deal with time management. I think a lot of CEOs, there's probably a billion blog pieces written about this kind of stuff of time management. And every CEO has their way. For, for me, I'm someone who does like my mental space to do deep work and the average day is there to defeat you from doing deep work. Um, everybody that emails you wants a piece of your time and no one realizes that there's a hundred other people emailing me <laughs> and everybody thinks that their email is the most important. So, you know, trying to like be respectful of other people who are trying to help you or need something, but want to work with your company trying to be respectful towards them, but also like balance that with making sure that we're focused on delivering what they need, what the customer need, what our partner needs, whatever. Um, that's a challenge. And so I am quite, quite, you know, just always trying to figure out how to create more space for myself, for the leadership team, for staff, how to say no quite a bit. Um, you know, a big thing. I, I I don't know if Warren Buffett intended this way, but it's something I, I learned from from him is just you got to say no and you got to say no a lot. Otherwise, there'll be kind of nothing left. Um, 
So. <laughs> yeah, no, great. No, no, thank you for sharing. Um, no, absolutely. Um, any other hacks that work well for you, or you, you know, that 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 you know you put into play and you're you're happy with the results? Yeah, I'd say just be very deliberate about scheduling. Yeah, every half a year I try to reset my calendar. I say this is what my ideal calendar looks like. Um, I just got some advice last week that you should add up your meetings you're in and once you hit your set limit, you know, I think for him it was 60 hours a week. You know, I think it'd be tr tough for me to not do 80 plus, but once you hit that limit, then, you know, you need deep work vacation or something. So that's a hack I'm going to try, but we'll see if it works. <laughs> 60 hours in total? Meetings, you know, meetings oh, wow. I can take. So. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I was counting up mine and I was 90 plus. So, uh, you know. For the week? For a month, for a month. Oh, for a month, yeah. 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 Okay, right, yeah. I think yeah. I think if you pulled people, you'd probably see a pretty massive range. I think with CEOs, it'd probably um, be certainly on the upper end, but, you know. Yeah, well, listen, uh, thanks for um, sharing. And uh, look, Chag, really appreciate you coming on today, sharing your kind of experience and insights. It's been really enlightening to hear about you know, advanced ionics, your pioneering work in the sector, the segments that you're, you know, you're going after, and I suppose your vision for a world of green hydrogen. Um, so I really appreciate it. And uh, to all our listeners tuning in, um, thanks for joining us today and stay informed and inspired by subscribing to Leaders on a Mission here. So until next time, 